Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have gathered together as brothers and sisters in faith to share our love and our praise for our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Gosh. It's not according to this. Okay, can you hear me? Hi. Thank you. Are there announcements this morning? Yes, I see one in the back. Uh, you, uh, you can sit right there and Bob Hornyak will bring you the microphone. Uh, Doreen's not here today, but she asked me to tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, the Ladies of Lyft will be going out next Tuesday. We decided to change the days to the second Tuesday of the month. Um, is it the third Tuesday? Third Tuesday of the month. Uh, it seems to suit everybody better. So we're going next Tuesday, we're going to the Blue Flame at 11.30. Blue Flame, 11.30 in the morning, right? Yes. In the afternoon or close afternoon. Uh, third Tuesday of the month, right? Or second Tuesday? Third Tuesday of the month. I think it's the third, third Tuesday of the month. Great. Uh, Lift. Third. Ladies in fellowship together. Great. Other announcements? I know we have Joyce. One, in the, one in the back. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're having our snack and chat. So we hope that after fellowship, every, uh, after worship, everyone will stick around and, and enjoy a patriotic picnic luncheon with us and spend some time with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. That's snack and chat immediately after worship. Uh, other announcements? I just want to bring everyone's attention that next week, for those who attend uh, our morning uh, adult Bible study, that is now going to, we're still going to meet, but... The elders and the deacon candidates are going to be examined by the session. Uh, so we look forward to that. And that's going to be 830 in the library, I mean, in the lounge. So anyone can come and see what it looks like to be for the session to examine uh, the elders and deacons. Now, having said that, all, we need elders to show up because we need a quorum of uh, active elders. So for those four elders who are, not, uh, who are rotating off, uh, you need to come because if we don't have a quorum, guess what? You're on until we get a quorum to examine the elders. So uh, just uh, that's what has to happen. So we look forward to that next week, and then we will have our ordination and installation of our elders and deacon candidates uh, on next Sunday. Any other announcements? Uh, also, <coughs> excuse me, we will have... Uh, uh, Rich Mills will be over here on the right uh, uh, for any private prayer that you would like to have uh, have after worship. So you can come up to him and share some private prayer, and he'll share with me to what degree or not degree you want that uh, uh, part of our uh, prayer chain. Uh, we are sending uh, out our prayer chain to a uh, uh, session and to our prayer chain individuals. If anyone would like to be on that, then at the uh, my, uh, Sunday after worship or Monday morning, you should get all the lists of prayers that have been prayed for during worship or that have come to my attention so that we can pray as a community. Sometimes I'll send it out to the entire church as I did this week uh, because we had three, some urgent prayer uh, concerns we need to address. So if you would like to be on that uh, chain, please let me know and we'll make sure you get on it. Any other announcements? Uh, summer fest, right here on the screen. Oh. Yeah, some of his best two weeks will be July 18th to 30th, and uh, Maria Costa, Marie Costa, and uh, Jen Costa will speak more about that probably next week. Any other announcements? If not, then let us center ourselves on the worship of God.
let us join together in a responsive call to worship. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I shall have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. The word of truth, utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually, forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. And I, and will I will lift up my hands toward, toward your commandments, commandments which I love, and, and I will meditate on your statutes. Love. Let us worship God. Let us go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. Lord of heaven, we rejoice that you are in heaven and that you are able to know each of us individually. Yet we also know that as you look down upon the children of man, we are all corrupt and turn away from what is right. Please forgive us and empower us through your Holy Spirit to always seek your Son. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Christian friends, we can be overwhelmed with our sin, overwhelmed with what it seems to be we can't be released from it. But know that God continues to be with us, for his covenant is sure. He, he does not abandon us. He loves us and he claims us for himself. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. amen. Let's now affirm what we believe by sharing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Joy, my 
Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. Lord of all knowing, you come, we come to you for your wisdom and understanding. We recognize that we often stray away from the truth, but ask that you focus us on your son as we hear your word proclaimed. Help us to share this good news with everyone who comes into our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Our first reading comes from Psalm 14, verses 1 through 7, and Psalm 53, verses 1 through 6. Please pay attention to the similarities of these two psalms. First from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand and seek after God. They have turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Now from Psalm 53. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from the heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have those who work evil no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God. There they are in great terror where there is no terror, for God scatters the bones of him who camps against you. You put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. So as you're looking in your bulletin, you might notice there's a theme today. <laughs> so um, we're kind of emphasizing the, the sermon today um, that Pastor's going to talk about. So we're going to listen to the song, uh, Nothing But the Blood. This is Carrie Underwood's version. I think it's, this is such a beautiful song, too. Um, it was written by Robert Lowry in 1876, um, and he wrote like over 500 songs um I'm trying to think of some of the other other ones that he did but um but i think that you know really listen to the words as as you're uh listening to the video and then we're going to sing it after the sermon so if you can just really take in the words and and kind of apply it to the sermon today and and understand what what this song was saying Thank you, Lisa. I always, when I see these videos, I always look, where, where could I be in that? I know I can't be the singer, and I knew it couldn't be the, the little uh, liar or the guitar guy, but I did see a guy with a little thing who was shaking like this, and I was going, I could do that. I could do that. But then he was a drummer as well, so I knew I can't do that. So I guess I can watch it. Okay. Our scripture today comes from, continues Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through uh, 20, I believe it's 26, yeah, 26. So hear these words from the Apostle Paul as he continues talking about righteousness and where we are in that process. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 
Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law through the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love when Scott instructs me to turn it on and use this because I would forget. Uh, but thank you, Scott. We want to, uh, Ken would have normally been here uh, this past week and this week, but uh, he is uh, uh, taking care of Belinda. She has a stomach issue. She has COVID, and by now, Ken thinks he might have COVID, so they're taking care of each other, so we want to keep them in our prayers. You might have noticed a theme today in the music, did you? Now, before I put further slides, does anyone get sick at the sight of blood? Okay, I, I, Patty, then you might want to close your eyes at some point, okay? I, I tried to keep most of the slides pretty tame because there was pretty some gruesome blood scenes in uh, some of the slides I could have used, but I tried to keep them tame, so I hope it works out. But if you start feeling nauseous, just close your eyes. Or the sermon thought for this passage really comes to be that Jesus Christ is the propitiation. Let's say that word together, propitiation. Isn't that a fun word? I try to use it five times a day, you know, propitiation. For our sins through his suffering and pain. The blood of Jesus that we are bought and then set free. And it is the blood of Jesus that brings us together in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Now, as I was addressing, some people have this big phobia. I mean, we have phobias a lot of things. Now, surprisingly enough, blood is not number one. Public speaking is number one. Fear of snakes is number two, but I think blood is in the top five. That coupled with needles can freak a lot of people out. It's why do people have such a problem uh, t uh, getting blood taken? Because they, it's blood and it's needles. And the fear of blood is called hemophobia. Now, it's interesting, though, that, love, that blood is the, uh, life, is the life of our bodies. That without blood, we can't exist, just like Oil is the lifeblood of an engine. Uh, blood is the, the thing that keeps us going. And it's so much important in God's eyes that God says, only I'm entitled to the blood of anything. No one can take blood from any creature and eat it or consume it or use it. So for those of you who like blood sausage, guess what? You know? God says the blood belongs to me. Now, those were Jewish dietary laws, true, but it's still very much that blood in Scripture is seen as exclusively God's providence because he gives life, and therefore blood belongs to him. Now, we do see blood in, in the world, and Nancy, being a former nurse, will always tell me, boy, and if we're watching a movie where there's a lot of blood, she'll say, boy, that blood looks fake. I don't think she's ever told me that blood looks real, she says it looks more real than usual, but blood is very different than fake blood. Now, anybody, do we have any phlebotanists here? People who take blood as a, as a career? Now, that would be a pretty demanding uh, career choice. Because one, you can't be afraid of blood, you can't be afraid of needles, and you have to deal with those who are, which could be pretty challenging. Now, 
There are some people who have no problem with needles. There are some people who have no problem with blood. But if you have a problem with both, then a phlebotomist has to put you at ease and calm you down to make sure that you can do, they can do what they need to do. But let's get to what the point of what we're talking about is. Yes, we have a phobia of blood. Yes, there's such things as phlebotomists out there. But really today we're talking about the power of the blood of Jesus. Now this is important to understand that the blood of Jesus is not a mystical, magical thing. I knew in seminary there was this guy who said, if we had a vial of the actual blood of Jesus, we'd just have to put a drop on someone and they'd be cured of the most horrible diseases. And I'm going, where are you getting that? Where is that in Scripture that is the blood of Jesus is this mystical, magical, physical thing? Now, it doesn't help that our Catholic brothers and sisters, we love them, do have seemed to have had that mindset that there's this transfiguration or transmortification of the bread and the wine and communion becoming the actual body and the blood, the physical body and the blood. That's what they believe. We don't believe that. We believe it's a spiritual thing. It's not mystical and magical. That's something else. But it is a spiritual understanding that the blood of Jesus is a spiritual a reality that we that gives us strength, gives us power, and gives us that cleanses of our sins. So let's get to what the passage is talking about in terms of that. Now remember, Paul has been talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles, especially in relationship to what we understand uh, ourselves to be saved and redeemed. And this continues that same theme as he says, "What then should we conclude? Are we any better?" Not at all. Are we Jews any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Now, I, I appreciate uh, Rich uh, standing in for uh, Kathy Lowe's today uh, in the, uh, as a lay leader. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rich. Now, I didn't know, well, he certainly would have known before he actually saw the bulletin that he's going to be reading not one, but two psalms. And he probably also didn't understand when he saw that there's two psalms that would be virtually, what's, did you notice any similarities? So that was a question. You know, now some people might wonder, oh, when they were putting together the Bible, did someone uh, forget they copied and pasted this, they just copied and pasted and put it somewhere else? Just to out, round out 150 psalms? No, this is an intentionality. Psalm 14, and I believe it's Psalm uh, 53, are virtually identical. And it starts with, there is no one righteous, not even one. That is the point of what it, both Psalms are saying. And here, Paul is repeating that understanding. It's God's balcony view on us. You know, God is, God is in heaven, and he literally says, God looks down from heaven and looks down upon men to see if any are righteous, anyone who understands. What's the conclusion? <laughs> there is no one, not one. And when, you know, I'm, I'm not a big absolute type of guy, meaning once you say always and ever or always or never, that, those are absolutes. And the only absolute is you should never, ever say always and never, you know. But other than that absolute, you, but God's looking down and says, is there any righteous? And he has an absolute no. He says, Jews and Gentiles are, there, are one in sinfulness. If they can claim anything, unity in anything, he says, yeah, we're all sinful. He goes on to qu basically quote and repeat Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. He says, there's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have, all, they have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Again, sort of ruining my thinking about absolutes because God is being very absolute here. The psalmist is saying not once, not twice, but even Paul is saying, this is a truism. Who is righteous among us? The fact that no one understands you doesn't mean you're an artist. You know, the fact that no, if you don't understand God doesn't mean that you're righteous. It means you're a sinner. Because we are called to understand God. So, do we seek God? And what does it mean not to seek God? How often do we turn away from God? Anyone? How often do we turn away from God? Every single time we sin. That's a deliberate decision to go, 
Can you hold that thought? Because <laughs> I want to do this over here. I'm deliberately turned away from you because I don't want to deal with this little righteousness thing and doing what you expect of me thing. I want to do this thing because this seems fun. This seems like I'm going to get a thrill out of this. That's a deliberate turning away from God and not seeking God. Because seeking God is an ongoing daily thing. It's a minute by minute, second by second kind of thing that we always are supposed to seek God. God, what are you calling for me to do right here, right now in my life? And when we fail to do that, we have stopped seeking God and we have turned away to God because we want to do our thing. And in that result, we become totally worthless. Now, for people with esteem issues, you don't like being called totally worthless. You probably don't even call, like to be called worthless. But again, God is not about niceties. He's not about political correctness. He's not about snowflakeism. He's about the truth. And he's saying, you know, when you turn away, when you do not seek God, you are utterly and completely and totally worthless. Jesus himself says this. Someone comes to him and says, oh, teacher, we know you're good. And then he asks him a question. And Jesus says, I'm out. Let me just address what you started with. There is no one who is good. Only God. That's it. Now, Jesus being God the Son, incarnate with us, did not claim that at that moment, at that time, because he knew the potentiality that he could sin. Did you know that? Jesus could sin. He had a choice. He had obedience to God's will, or he had the choice to do in his own thing, to turn it away from God, from seeking his own will. We see him coming, asking that question. He says, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, take this cup from me. He could have said, yeah, by the way, don't worry. I'm out of here. He could have done that. He chose to be obedient because he was so closely tuned and tied to God's will and seeking God second by second by second, so there's never a time that he did not understand that. So, but he did not claim that. He said, no one's good. So he was repeating what Psalm 14 says and what Psalm 53 said, that no one's good. Now, that's hard for us, isn't it? We look at little babies. Oh, you're good. And I'm not pointing out Sam here. Because Sam's perfect, okay, exception. But, you know, you look at a little baby and you go, oh, perfect. Oh, you're just wonderful. You're so innocent. You're, you're, you're no sin. I've known people who said, uh, you know, I, I've used this very passage before, and they said, you know, it really upsets me when you say that because this person, member of our church, never sins, never has done anything wrong. I've gone to that person and I said, I've just talked to him in conversation. I said, yeah, I've done some pretty bad things in my life. Okay. Jesus is clear. No one is good. None of us can claim that because we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But then Paul says, let me give you a list of how we do this. He says, you know, in our turning away from God, our throats are open graves, our tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on our lips. There, our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what does God hate? I mean, that was things we do, but what does God exactly hate? God hates when we act like open graves, when our words are bitter and hateful, and we're seeking our way and not his way. Because when we do that, our lying tongue is, is seeking to deceive, so we will have the advantage, and God's not up for that. But God hates all sin, not just that sin. But deception and deceit and hypocrisy is especially offensive to God. Peter says, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Yes, our actions are always towards our own end. But our actions are preceded by our attitude and our attitude is usually expressed in our words. So when we speak in a hateful, bitter, gossipy, malicious way, our actions follow that. So if we keep our thoughts positive, that should keep our words positive, which then should hopefully keep our actions more positive than not. 
you know, James talks about this again when he says, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. He says, how can a stream be both good and uh, bitter? So our words, again, he goes to that, understand that open grave of our hearts speaks out through our mouth, which then speaks out through our actions. Paul continues that same mindset when he says, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways. Now, I wanted to get a passage that says God hates feet that shed innocent blood, but most of the time, most of the time it's not feet. It's hands that shed innocent blood. But we run towards that. Paul would, I mean, that would be, have the same principle, that sometimes we seem that we don't walk, we don't stroll, we run towards hurting others. Now, again, I would like to think that none of us or very few of us or any of us have ever hurt physically other people. I'm sure we have. There's, I'm sure all of us could say at one time we've done that in some way. But, again, this is a more a mental and emotional aspect that and the words we use, remember that open grave? The words we use, the bitterness and the maliciousness of our words, definitely can shed innocent blood, innocent emotions, innocent abilities for people to establish self-esteem, innocent uh, for people to understand themselves. You know, I saw, and I, please don't, I hope this is all right, Barbara. I saw Barbara, you know, whispering to Sam, Sam when we were singing. Now, I am sure... She was saying something sweet, which is great. Good grandmother. But I'm sure if she was saying, oh, Sam, you're a little sinner. You're a little sinner, Sam. I don't think that would have been the best parenting or grandparenting advice to do. Because you want to build someone up. But how often, not maybe that, do we say stuff that can be incredibly hurtful to others without thinking? We say, oh, I didn't mean that. Well, then why did you say it? Again, that comes from maybe our backstory of our own pain, but do we extend that? And that is not just a physicality of innocent, shedding innocent blood, but it's a, an emotional, verbal shedding of innocent blood that we sometimes seem to run swiftly towards. Thomas Jefferson says, A pirate spread in misery and ruin over the face of the ocean are those who seek to do their own thing their own way without any regard for anyone else. We just sail in, do our thing, sail away, and not think about the consequences of what was left behind. If we fail to think of consequences, then we are that pirate. If we fail to th think of consequences, then we are not seeking God. We're seeking our own will. That whole expression, I tell it like it is, that is a horrible thing to say. Because basically you're saying is that I want to say the meanest and cruelest things without any regard for how other people feel. So that should never be on our tongues as Christians. I tell it like it is. We, t we, speak gentle, we speak words of gentleness and love. That's what God calls us to do as brothers and sisters in Christ. So he continues, Paul continues with Romans. He says, the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, if you're always fighting, fighting battles, you're always at war. If we're always contending against God, then we're always at war against God. If we're always fighting battles with other people, we're always at war with them. Do we seek reconciliation? Do we seek peace? Not the peace as an absence of war, but peace in its purest form, as seeking to reconcile, heal, and forgive others. If we don't do that, then we're always at war with someone, and mostly we're at war with God. But do we fear God? Now, fear is a, uh, is a word that we have to understand. Fear is not terror. Fear is not horror. Fear is not, oh, God is like the boogie person. See, I was politically correct then, politically correct there. I didn't say boogie man. That would have been insensitive on my part. It's a boogie person, okay? You know, so God is not that. But we are in awe for who he is of his righteousness and his goodness and the fact that he has redeemed us and the fact that he loves us and he holds us. That's awe. That's amazement should be on our part. You know, we fear God, but what about the man who has no fear of God, who tells himself God does not exist? 
Because we know in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, when we look at what happened in Japan this week, what's happening, it seems, across our, our, our country, time and time again, a mass shooting here, a mass shooting there, you know, people dying. Are these people that have just turned away from God, or are these people that have no fear of God? Because obviously they're illustrating they, des they despise wisdom and instruction. They despise, you know, living in a world with others, but they are doing their own thing their own way. And if that becomes the template of what society is about, then we are in a bad, bad place. It reminds me of what it said in Judges. Uh, numerous times, especially as we get into the end, you have these great judges at the beginning. These are before the king of Israel. You have these really super judges. You know, they begin with Joshua, and then they have Caleb, and, you know, you come. But then you get down to the end. I mean, those who were in the Bible study with that, they get down to the end judges. Samson, further down. People start doing what's right in their own eyes. There was, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did what was ever seen bright in their own eyes. And what seemed bright in their own eyes was pretty, pretty bad. When we do what's right in our own eyes, we have no other, again, template to operate against. We're not thinking about what God wants. We're thinking about what we want. And what we want in the moment can often seem good. It was, again, the guy who assassinated uh, uh, the prime minister, the former prime minister in Japan, he was going after religious leader first. He says, I want to kill this guy. But he says, no, that seems too hard, so I'll, hard, so I'll go after this guy. Really? He did what was right in his eyes, even though both instances would have been harmful and hateful. It continues in Romans by saying, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we look at the law, when we go going back to understand our own unrighteousness, when we do see God, we look to the law. We talked about that, I think, last week, about the Ten Commandments, about, uh, you know, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Boil down into those two things. Well, when we look at that, does that say... Oh, wow, I'm doing that? Or do, do we say, oh, wow, I'm not doing that? Because we are supposed to not, if we can't do what God calls us to do, then we need to be quiet about it. Because we have to recognize our own self as sinful and sinners more than anything else. We are not accepting God for who God is. We're not following him. We have to be held accountable. And what will hold us accountable? The law holds us accountable. We look at the law and we can say, yes, this is holding us accountable. This is telling us we are sinful. Albert Camus says a guilty conscience needs to confess. And then he would say, as a writer, a work of art is a confession. Sometimes when we finally turn from our not seeking God, and our lack of fear of God, we recognize, wow, I really dug myself into a pit. And I need to confess this. I need to share this. I need to let other people know about this. I need to let God know about it. Because now I want to turn back to him. Now, Paul continues to say, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, God has been made known. To which the law and the prophets testify pointing to, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And though there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. We have crossed the threshold of, and division between Jew and Gentile because now, not through the law, but through our seeking righteousness, seeking, never achieving, seeking righteousness, we come to understand who God is. And that leads us to understand God's word, which is the law and the prophets. Because Jesus is that fulfillment. If you read the Law and the Prophets, it points to Jesus. And then if you read the Gospels and the commentaries, they point back to Jesus. Because Jesus is the centrality of our faith and what we believe. Because he is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Because we have to come back to the centrality of what Paul says. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But we're all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came from Jesus Christ. 
We are all guilty of something. Other people might not know. In fact, we are very good at hiding our guilt. But we're all guilty of something. I knew this guy who everyone says, he's such a great guy. He's such a righteous man. And by talking to him, I could, I, he told me about, all, again, like I said, all these unrighteous things he had done. He never disputed that with people. says, you know, I'm not good. Don't make me good. He liked that affirmation. And he even at times did not see this, the things he had done as bad. He was someone, sadly to say, that did not see God and had no fear of God. Again, I love this picture. Again, falling short. It's like running that race and just not being able to make it past that finish line. There's a, there's a picture of a, a picture in the news about this runner. He runs this race. I don't know how long it was, but he's running, and he is near the end, and he's exhausted. You can see he's totally exhausted. But he's almost at the end, and his mom jumps out of the crowd, puts his, her arm around him, and helps him across the finish line. Now, who thinks that was a sweet thing to do? Well, he was disqualified from the race because it's against the rules to be helped across the finish line. And I wonder what he was saying as he's running. He says, oh, it's just there, the lighthouse. I just got to get there. And mom puts it, says, I'll help you. And he's going, what are you doing? Because regardless of what he might have wanted, he was disqualified. The great thing about us is that God in Christ, he is the one that gets us across the finish line. We can't by our own, our own selves, but God does. Because the more clearly we see the infinite chasm between God's glory and our sinful falling short there, thereof, the greater will be our appreciation for his grace and love in bridging that gulf to redeem us. It's nice. I mean, I, I love the people putting the thumbs up. Yeah, mom, that mom did such a great thing. Well, you know, for him, I don't think her son, she, he was appreciative because it disqualified him. But we can't make it across. We can't even start the race until we have Jesus Christ holding us and lifting us and giving us strength. So we come to, in Paul, at the end of this passage, Paul then puts it all together. He says, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Again, propitiation. This was what, part of what I was seeing in a couple of weeks when I messed up my slides a bit. I didn't talk about it because I want to talk about it here. It means, in the most simplest way, atonement. Now, again, we can say, okay, what does atonement mean? It's a payment for. So, the blood of Jesus pays for our sins. His suffering washes us clean. Just like as we were singing in the song, nothing but the blood of Jesus makes us whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus makes us clean again. Without the shedding of his blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. This is what is required. Sin requires payment. To be just, sin requires payment. And if we hurt others, if we kill others, if we impose our will, negative as it may be, on others, and that has to be accounted for. So it's what Jesus does on the cross and his suffering appeases God's anger, God's righteous anger. And it's through the faith that we have hope, and it's in hope but now we generate love towards those around us. Because faith is not knowing what the future holds, but knowing who holds the future. It's through that forgiveness of our sins through that propitiation, that atonement that we recognize who we are and recognize that we always are seeking Jesus but even more than that, that we recognize that when we seek Jesus Jesus always responds and when we don't seek Jesus, Jesus pulls us back to himself because he calls us before we are able to call and understand who he, who he is and again, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness we are called to trust. Knowing what Jesus has done, we don't want to at times because we like what we've got. 
But we also know when we do extend trust to what Jesus has promised, that he returns tenfold back to us. Now, this is not a business arrangement. Now, why is Jesus hiding the teddy bear? Because the little girl wants to focus on hers. But when she's willing to give that up, and that's not a teddy bear, but our ego, our addictions, all the things that we have, God returns to us tenfold in, in our understanding of his love. We still have it, we just don't recognize it. It's like we have the teddy bear right there, we just don't recognize it. We don't recognize that's ours. All we have to do is open our eyes. Because the blood of Jesus never fails. We have been redeemed. That's a good answer. We've been redeemed. The atonement has occurred. We just have to recognize what God in Christ has already done. And that is the joy of what, why we gather together, to share that joy, to share that understanding that despite the fact that we are sinners, God loves us, has called us, he claims us, and he helps us to now share that with everyone that comes near. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we ask your continued prayers for Christy who again is in her third battle with lymphoma. She has pneumonia and has been intubated. She, they have not found, can, uh, they think the cancer has spread to her lungs. She has, the intubation has been removed, but to pr please be with her during this very difficult time. Lord, also be with Andy Wonka's uh, friend, uh, Schultz. Uh, he's experienced some long COVID symptoms that he can barely get out of bed. Lord, we thank you that uh, Terry Nicholson is out of the hospital, and she's so appreciative of all the prayer cards and well wishes she had while she was in. Let, let us continue to pray for her as she recovers at home. Be with her nephew, Connor, who uh, returned from his uh, trip to France and Ireland. Uh, he came back with COVID along with several others, so let him get well. We rejoice, Lord, that Donna Carney is doing, a, had, a, had a scan and did, had much improvement over uh, uh, her health issues. Be with uh, the family of uh, Peggy Happy's brother, whose son uh, died in a, a four-wheeler accident on Friday. Uh, we ask you to be with Peggy, but also with her brother and his family, uh, who, is, uh, who has some, his own uh, physical issues. Uh, Lord, we... Uh, continued blessings of uh, uh, care for Belinda, who has COVID, and who is also the stomach, stomach intestinal issues. Uh, be with uh, uh, Ken as well, as he seeks to uh, care for her and to recover if he has COVID as well. We, are, we praise you, Lord, that Tom Fox is back home uh, from, and here today from having issues with uh, a nosebleed and bleeding from leg sores, etc. He was in the hospital for some tests, and we're glad he's here. We ask your uh, blessings upon the Dempsey family at the passing of Anna Marie. Uh, just give uh, that entire family, especially Bob and Susie, your care and presence. Uh, be with uh, Patty Wonka's brother-in-law, Tom, who's uh, continued to struggle with uh, pneumonia, the after effects of uh, the, the two weeks he had with pneumonia. Pr we praise you that his lungs are clear. He does have cancer. Be with his wife, Linda, as she supports him. And Lord, be with... Um, those who have silent heartache and heartbreak, uh, all of us have it to some degree. Be with all of us who uh, mourn uh, or who are grieving or who are just angry or upset at things that are happening in our lives. Be with Larry, Bob Hawk's friend, uh, who has leukemia. We praise you that Josiah was sworn in as the deputy sheriff uh, on Tuesday and is uh, working uh, administratively uh, in Spotsylvania until his, the academy starts on the 18th. Uh, we thank you that he found a place to live and he's enjoying it. And Lord, we ask you to be with uh, Joyce Weber, with uh, her mom, as they're really working hard, she's really working hard to take care of her. Uh, let her mom 
uh, understand that and not struggle against it. And again, continue prayers for John as he uh, continues uh, to uh, focus on uh, recovery from all his illnesses. Uh, we thank you that Amber is recovering, Amber Walker is recovering from COVID and be with Ethel, Ethel Deerfield as she looks forward to her new recliner chairlift. Oh Lord, there's so many uh, prayers, other prayers that we could lift up to you, but we thank you for your love and your presence in our lives. We thank you for the joy you give us, for being the propitiation uh, of blood for our sins, that you have redeemed us and you've, uh, your son has atoned for what we've done wrong, that you have claimed us and that we are now uh, claimed by you and will one day be with you. Until then, Lord, without undue, without, undue, without undue haste and without undue delay, let us all seek in each and every day to do what you're calling us to do, to not turn away, to, but to seek you, knowing that when we do, that you just give more and more and more to us. Bless us, Lord, in all that we say and do. We ask this in your son's holy name. We toss and pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, it's right and proper that God has given us so much that we return a portion to him. Our offering basket is in the back. People have already laid their offer, some offerings, uh, their offerings as they've entered, but those who still would like to can put their offerings in the basket as they leave. And we, again, we always welcome our uh, folks on Zoom and later on YouTube and the audio. If you'd like to send your offerings in, we would rejoice because we seek to use these offerings as a ministry to reach out not only to those here in Lebanon, but into the community. Let us pray. The Lord, bless these gifts. Bless them to your purpose and your understanding. And we rejoice that they can be used to do that. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to be a good evangelist. Help us to always seek you in whatever we say and do. We ask all this in your son's holy name. Amen. Let us stand.